The Ohio Soybean Council and the Soybean Checkoff established the Soybean Rewards Program to provide Ohio soybean farmers information, research, and other resources about yields, premium opportunities, new varieties, disease and pest management, conservation best management practices, and much, much more. For more information, check them out on the web at soybeanrewards.org. That's soybeanrewards.org. Independent Country Music Hall of Fame artist Richard Lynch has toured the world, performing thousands of concert dates during his nearly 40 years in country music. If you're interested in bringing Richard Lynch and his award-winning band to your venue, fair, festival, or other special event, please contact us at richardlynchband.com. That's our website, richardlynchband.com. Hello once again, everyone. We're visiting with Kath Ann Kress. Kath Ann is the new Dean of the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences and the new Vice President for Agricultural Administration. Now, that is a lot to say. It's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but at Ohio State, any kind of... Well, uh, at the Ohio State University. <laughs> I am corrected. I, I shouldn't. I, I do know that. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, where, where you came from before this position at Ohio State. Oh, I'd be happy to. Yes, I, I came here in May from Iowa State University in Ames, uh, and there I was Vice President for Extension and Outreach, uh, so working with all of our programs all throughout the state, much like we have with Extension programs here uh, in Ohio. Uh, and before that, I had the great privilege of serving uh, at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was responsible for providing support uh, to families of the Reserve and Guard who are primarily rural. And so working with the land-grant universities throughout uh, the nation uh, to do that. And before that, I had quite a stint at the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, working uh, with programs that were prim primarily around agricultural education. Now, uh, after coming to the Ohio State University in, in your current position, mm -hmm. uh, do you come with certain goals in mind, or are you uh, at first just sort of perusing the, uh, the outline of what uh, the college has to offer? Well, a little bit of both. Uh, you know, certainly there's uh, a lot to learn here in Ohio, the breadth of agriculture, uh, the breadth of the talent of our faculty and students. Uh, I, I certainly want to make sure I take all that in. Uh, but I certainly have some, some goals for us as well. As I, I looked at this position, uh, I think while we have a tremendous amount of talent, we've got a lot of great partners, uh, it would really be helpful for us to have a little bit more focus with some of the work we do, and so that's what I'm hoping uh, we can bring to this as well. So, now, I'm not sure if you've been here long enough to know, but uh, by someone that is, has been uh, reared in, in this uh, climate here, so to speak, uh, Ohio has, has the ideal... Uh, the, the fact that so many organizations, uh, the college itself, the, uh, the Department of Agriculture at the state level, mm -hmm. uh, the industry, uh, everybody sort of works together. Some, yes. st some states, oh, yes. that's not the case. Oh, but no. Some very... states, that's not true. Uh, but it is absolutely true. I, I have been so uh, pleased with how warmly I've been welcomed, how we're already uh, working on building collaborations, uh, and many of the partnerships that are longstanding. Uh, you're right, you don't see that everywhere. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I come here from Iowa where thankfully there was a similar spirit of collaboration with everybody really recognizing how important it is to the agriculture industry that we work together, that we have unified messages about our industry. Uh, those are all really important things to our future, and, and I'm really happy to see that here as well. The Farm Science Review at the Molly Kieran Agricultural Center is uh, one of the premier shows across the country. Have you had uh, the, the, the access to the review in, in past years, or is this a first for you? Oh, this is a first for me. Uh, you know, in the past I attended the Farm Progress Show, uh, you know, which was often hosted in Iowa. Uh, but I hadn't made it here uh, to this, so I'm very excited to be here. Uh, it's, it's almost like being a, a child on Christmas morning, isn't it? You know, everything that I'm interested in and, and care about is all like right here all at the same time. You just have to walk a little bit and then there's something else. As they've been trying to drive me around today to meet people and see things, I keep making them stop because I see something I want to see or somebody I want to talk to instead. And, you know, the demonstrations are going on right now and that's been pretty exciting. I hear somewhere on the grounds you can test pilot some drones. I want to get a chance to do that. 
But the thing that I've really been excited about this morning is the number of young people that I've been seeing. You know, the FFA groups and the 4-Hers and others, uh, your own grandson here. Uh, it's, it's just terrific to see these young people coming out, learning more about agriculture, uh, and having this uh, great opportunity to be, be exposed to all of the technology, the science, and the opportunities all in one place at one time. You know, if we go back uh, a few uh, persons in your position, I remember uh, uh, when Bobby... Uh, well, Bobby's here. I just ran into oh, him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when Bobby was first here, we, uh, you know, we, we spent several years at the review, and, and toward the, those last years that uh, before he retired, I kept mentioning to him that, you know, Bob, if... if we wanted to get into Ohio State University now. I don't think we could make it because the kids, the students, uh, they were just getting better and better all the time. And, and that has to be a, a feather in the cap for the college itself. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we are so proud of our students and, and their talent. And, and it's not only that, but we're absolutely committed to student success. Uh, and a good example I can give you of that is that uh, when we know that once a student gets into our college, uh, our first year and second year retention rates are among the best at the university. And so what that tells me is they get in, the, it's a high quality education, it's meaningful, and we're providing support. Uh, and that keeps them uh, staying in school, which is what we want. Uh, part of that is because about three out of four of our students uh, get scholarships. Uh, we want to keep uh, this experience at the university affordable for their families, and so I'm really proud of the fact that we have that many scholarships that we're able to offer to our very talented students. Uh, the other thing that we're best in the university about uh, is uh, that our students complete their degrees uh, at a higher rate in four years than any other part of the university. And that's even doing internships and some other experience like study abroad. Uh, and I, I think that's just a great testimony to our faculty and how well they plan the curriculum. Uh, but that's important for students to be able to get in, get a high quality education, and then get moving. And we know they get moving at a great rate. 92% uh, of our students, uh, when they graduate, are going to be hitting the ground running with either a job or already accepted into graduate school. And we're very proud of that, too. Well, you know what? Uh, the Ohio State University also starts at an earlier age, knowing that kids, maybe uh, students in the third, fourth grades, uh, if they can get a little taste of agriculture, that might propel them on to a career in that industry as well. You bet. And that's why 4-H, um, which is, of course, one of our extension programs, and then our partnership with FFA, those are really important. Uh, because we know there's fewer and fewer young people who are having that firsthand experience of growing up on a farm themselves. Uh, and so we really want as many young people as possible to understand uh, the, the breadth of agriculture and the terrific careers, you know, whether it's uh, in production, whether it's uh, studying the science and biology or uh, natural resources in the environment. Uh, whether it's technology with precision farming or, you know, the drones and all the artificial intelligence, or whether it's also things like international trade and policy and communications. Agriculture has all those kinds of career opportunities, as you well know, uh, and we want to make sure young people really can appreciate uh, what a great industry this is to work in. Well, I'm sure our viewer now knows that you're a very busy lady, and uh, we wish you all the, the best. And uh, if folks would like to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to go about doing that? Well, if you just come to the Ohio State University website and you look for our college, you'll find me pretty pretty fast uh, within our college. And I, I really do appreciate hearing from people. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that we're successful in the college is because we have great partners and great supporters throughout the state, and, and we're very appreciative of that. Kath Ann, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, and go Bucks. Allen Davis Insurance Agency, with 30 years commitment to the community, providing quality insurance services. Allen is a business owner and an active farmer, and he knows firsthand the pressures of running your farming operation. Call Allen today and ask about coverage for your farm, your vehicles, your equipment, crops, and more. Call 1-800-686-2148. That's 1-800-686-2148. Welcome back to In Ohio Country Today. And we're out here at the beautiful Molly Karen Ag Center, uh, right here west of Columbus. And with me today is Chris Lomers with Coba Select Sires, um, you know, located right here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, actually, uh, there's actually two locations, really. Yep. But uh, uh, talk a little bit about your background, first of all. Okay. Uh, and then you could tell us a little bit about, uh, at a, a 30,000 feet level, what Coba Select Sires uh, is about. 
COBA was started in uh, 1946, and it was, as you mentioned, located in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we still maintain the present facility in uh, Columbus. And then uh, over the years, we combined with two other co-ops to form Select Sires, the Federation. And today, Select Sires is made up of nine member co-ops throughout the country. Uh, COBA is the one that takes care of Ohio, Western PA, Northwest West Virginia, and then as uh, well as fourth southern states in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Oklahoma. So that's what comprises COBA, and as I said, we're one of the nine member co-ops. Well, you know, people are probably wondering, well, what, you know, for those folks that maybe are watching our show that don't really have a, a farm background or a livestock background, maybe you want to really talk about what, what uh, COBA and Select Sires is about. So we market, uh, our core business is dairy genetics. So we uh, market a bull semen to our member owner customers uh, throughout the country and then internationally as well. We also specialize in some animal health products that we market as well to try and help our, our member owner customers, our dairymen that we serve. So uh, most of our business is through dairy semen. And with that being said, I'd say 95% uh, of our sales are in the dairy industry uh, with a little bit of, in beef cattle as well. Well, you know, uh, uh, the dairy industry uh, is, uh, you know, getting very, very, uh, uh, the herds are getting very large and kind of uh, uh, not as many herds, just as many cows, but, right. but, not, but not as many uh, physically uh, located dairies. Uh, how is that, uh, how do you guys play into that? Well, we try and uh, our goal is uh, to improve genetics and improve the profitability of farms. And as you said, the, the number of farms continues to decrease. I just saw a figure today where Ohio was down about 2,000 cows, but up about 2% in milk production uh, year to date. So the number of cows continues to decrease, but through better nutrition and better genetics, our milk production per cow continues to increase. So, uh, you know, we maintain the, the supply needed for the, the consumers out there. You know, uh, I'm kind of intrigued with, uh, you know, the whole genetics. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing that, you know, you, you provide the semen to breed to cows. Um, uh, but you also, uh, in the breeding process, you know, I'm, I'm pretty intrigued by not only the, that, but f the fertilizing of a cow and then flushing the eggs. Uh, there is some uh, what we call a <clears throat> flush, as you mentioned, flushing cow where they do multiple ovulations. Uh, we actually own some donors as well where we own the females and uh, try and produce the next generation uh, through produ producing the next great bull and superior genetics uh, through our own program. So we don't do a lot of the flushing per se ourselves, but we have uh, you know, veterinarians that, that provide that service. You know, something else that I, that I learned, uh, and since we've sold the dairy cows, we don't, we don't have all that you know, constant, you know, interaction with, you know, what's new in the, in, in the industry is the sex semen. I find that kind of, uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Sex semen is something that we, uh, was a new technology several years ago that uh, it goes through a process, it goes through a fly, flow cytometer where they are able to put a dye on the individual sperm and then sort out the female sperm uh, versus the male, where uh, the, with that new technology, it's about 90% females. You will see a, a slight drop and conception rate uh, with the sex semen, but uh, the advantage is, is that uh, our producers can get females out of their best genetics in the herd, as well as have easier calving on their first calf heifers. You know, so, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, the uh, the dairy industry at quite a length, but you did mention about, because I know beef cattle are becoming, you know, uh, uh, more and more uh, prevalent in Ohio. Uh, you know, my brother went from milking cows to having beef cattle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you made mention, uh, talk a little bit about some of the genetics that uh, you guys really have uh, for the beef industry as well. We, we handle several different beef breeds, with Angus obviously being the most predominant. Um, as you mentioned, uh, beef cattle are becoming more popular. It's something that uh, people can use, have a full-time job and still keep cattle on the side. And, uh, you know, our goal is to try and help those producers uh, provide a better generation of beef cattle and uh, offer those AI services to them as well. Well, you know, you also made mention that, uh, you know, this is a co-op, and I think that's kind of important because the co-op means what? It means that uh, we return dividends back to our member owner customers. So it's been something that uh, we've really strived to work as a true co-op for the past 10 years. Uh, we've averaged about 9% returns on uh, people's purchases. So uh, patronage is something that we try and focus on and make sure that we operate as a true co-op. Well, Chris, if somebody wanted to find out more information about COBA and Select Sires, where can they go? They can go to COBA Select Sires, www.cobaselect.com. So. Thanks for being with us. All right. Thank you.
Welcome to the 30-second tour of your local poet plant. Local producers sell us tons of their grain. We grind it, mix it with water and special enzymes. The result is fermented, distilled, and dehydrated until it's 200 proof alcohol. Corn oil is extracted, and protein and nutrients are condensed, dried, and turned into animal feed, bringing our tour to an end with high protein feed and cleaner burning high octane fuel. Visit poet.com to learn more. Automate your existing sliding doors with Propel Automation of Ohio. Automate up to 60-foot twin sliding shed or barn doors with their award-winning patented system. And now Propel Automation of Ohio is part of Ohio AgriBility Program, allowing Ohio farmers and farm families who are coping with disabilities or long-term health conditions to automate their doors. For security, safety, convenience, remember Propel Automation of Ohio. Check us out on the web at PropelOhio.com. I'm Terry McClure, a fifth generation soybean farmer. Farming can be tough, but we have the Ohio Soybean Council investing farmers dollars to find new uses for soybeans. Their research helps develop better beans for livestock, poultry, and for people. It also helps create new products like soy-based cleaning supplies and ink cartridges. Plus, cleaner burning soy biodiesel reduces our dependence on foreign oil. Soybeans are Ohio's number one agricultural export. To learn more, visit SoyOhio.org. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to In Ohio Country Today. Big Dan Wilson alongside of Fred Michelle, and Fred is a professor at the OARDC, and we're here at Farm Science Review at your energy booth. Tell us a little bit about what you're uh, trying to achieve here with the general public uh, at this particular booth. Okay, thanks, Dan. We're talking to the public about renewable energy and different forms of renewable energy. Some you may have heard of, some you may not have heard of. Um, one of these is solar electric energy, and a lot of farmers now are installing solar systems on their farms to try to offset some of the energy production that they use for farming during the year. Um, and there's some laws in Ohio that allow this to be really beneficial. One of them is called net metering, which means you only pay for the amount of electricity that you actually use. So if you produce some with solar, you use a little bit more later, you subtract the amount that you produce, and you only pay for that net amount. And so, for example, for grain drying, you can produce a whole bunch of energy during the entire year, and then you can use that energy for those that one or two months when you're actually doing grain drying and conserve that. Um, the price of solar panels has decreased almost by 80 to 90 percent over the past 10 years. So the price of getting into these systems is much less than it used to be. There's also some incentives available to uh, farmers. There's both a federal tax credit of 30 percent, which goes through 2019. It then declines gradually down to 10 percent over about three or four years. Um, so it'll still be available, but it's starting to decrease. So now's the time really to get into this. There's also uh, REAP grants, which is a USDA program for renewable energy in rural areas. And it's for businesses primarily. And so those two programs, the REAP program provides a grant and also a uh, low interest loan for farmers. Um, and just the cost of the systems now are, are much lower. So even without these incentives, uh, it may be a economically uh, profitable uh, option for farmers to do. Uh, businesses that have been mass producing these uh, just kind of uh, in and out as far as uh, economics is concerned, but we're starting to see a resurgence to where it's not only affordable for the individual small commercial business owner and our farmers that are out there, but also the return on their investment is a lot quicker than what it used to be. Uh, that's true, and there's some tools that we've we've developed here at Ohio State University. Eric Romick, who's in the tent with me, and works for Ohio State Extension, has uh, five or six fact sheets that describe the basics of solar energy, but also some tools like the solar or systems analysis model developed by the federal labs, which allows you to put in all the information about your farm. You know, its orientation, what utility you use, what panels you may be installing, inverter you'd be using. And from that, it'll predict the payback um, on the system. How many years will that take? Uh, so I recommend anyone interested in, in taking a look at that. So some of the other things that you're demonstrating and actually educating the general public on include biomass and bioenergy. Let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, for years, we've been looking at ways that we can turn that waste on the farm into energy. And uh, technology is really amazing and how that has all changed. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in here to educate the general public and our farmers about that particular alternative. 
Yeah, I'll just introduce that by saying our campus in Worcester is powered, 30 to 40 percent of our electricity comes from biogas production, from food waste and manure in, our, in a anaerobic digester. So what we're showing the public here is anaerobic digester systems, how they operate, and what the best types of feedstocks are for those systems. A lot of farmers are interested in using these for manure, um, but manure is usually a lower energy feedstock. So usually the most profitable digesters will use a combination of feedstocks. They'll use the manure from the farm, amended with something else, like a food waste from a food producer, or maybe from a city. In fact, the one that we have on our campus uses food waste from Walmart's produce section. So those kinds of waste will give you a much bigger bang for the buck. Yeah, so the systems are capital I intensive. So usually they operate better for a larger scale operation than a smaller operation. A lot of times these systems are put in where there's other issues to deal with. For example, in New York State, they have a lot of issues with odors. And so these systems will contain all the manure and, and reduce the odor potential. Um, and they'll get some incentive for that. In California, there's uh, air quality issues in the valley. And so these systems will control that release of, of volatile organics into the atmosphere. So in Ohio, we have less of those kind of issues, although we are expanding. Um, but these systems usually are paying for themselves with tipping fees from high COD waste that's otherwise going to the wastewater treatment plant. So that's really the model that's used. They'll charge a fee for these energy intensive feedstocks to come in. They'll also be digesting their manure at the system um, and then generating some renewable energy. And it really takes all of those things together to make them really pay back. Well, you talk about uh, cutting technology, especially here at Farm Science Review. Uh, we've been on the air since 2005, and the very first year that we were here, we were talking about um, wind energy. And the wind energy that was uh, being described to us was something that was going to not only uh, give us alternatives and save us from uh, fossil fuels, but also provide us the opportunity to, to do renewables at an affordable rate and get a good return on the investment. It was also at that time that we talked about biomass. We talked a lot about solar. So it's so cool to see these types of alternatives come to fruition, not only for the benefit of our farmers and the return on the investment and the cost savings, but also the environmental impact as well. Yeah, that's true. These systems will reduce the greenhouse gas production from energy production. So, for example, when you're burning natural gas, uh, when you're burning petroleum, uh, when you're burning coal to make electricity, you're putting fossil carbon into the atmosphere, and that's influencing our climate. So these are ways we can reduce that influence of energy use. So if people wanted more information, Fred, I mean, where do they go to find out about all this cutting-edge technology that you're doing here at the OARDC and as well as The Ohio State University? I would recommend first checking out OSU Extension. Our, we have a website which has fact sheets, which sort of give you a general introduction to a lot of these things. There's also this fact sheet series I did describe from Eric Romick. Um, with the digesters, we do have some programs that will do renewable energy programs each year. Uh, seminars and those sorts of things. So keep an eye out for those. Uh, those are given at different parts of the state. Um. Our guest uh, this afternoon has been Fred Michelle. He's a professor at the Ohio State University's OARDC campus in beautiful Wooster, Ohio. Fred, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Good talking to you. And welcome back to the Propel Tractor Pick of the Week. And today, we are here with Jim LaRue, and uh, Jim, tell us a little bit about your involvement with the Allen County Fair as far as being a superintendent. Okay, I've been a superintendent, I think 31, 32 years, I'm not sure which year we started, 84, 85, and, and I've been kind of involved with tradition and uh, hay press and cutting grain and stuff like that, and then we kind of did away with it here just a few years ago. So anymore, uh, we have the tractor pulls a big thing anymore here, so. It goes over like this year is one of the biggest ones we've ever had, I think, on tractor pulling. Really, a lot of tractors here this year. Yes, I, I was impressed to see how many antique tractors did turn out, you know, for the Allen County Fair this year. And I noticed uh, just walking through those tractors that quite a few of them had the D-rings on, you know, for pulling, including yours. Um, you know, could you tell us a little bit about the tractor we're uh, sitting in front of? <clears throat> yeah, this is a 1951 Massey Harris. 
I bought it about approximately uh, 30 years ago. And uh, come from a little town north of here, Vaughnsville, and a guy had bought it brand new in 51. And in fact, he wanted to buy it back off of me. I said, no, it pulls so good. I'd well, like to keep it. And he said, well, that's one reason I wanted to buy it back. And I went by his place here last year and never said another Massey 44. So I guess he really liked him too. And then he said they used to do a lot of pulling back in the, in the 50s, pulled cement blocks. And he said, uh, this tractor always won a lot, you know, and really pulled good. And he said, that's kind of wanted it back, you know. So I said, that's why I like to keep it, too. So he said, it really pulls good. I've won a lot of ribbons out here or, or plaques, you know, first place. And, but sometimes another guy will buy a, maybe a little newer tractor, better tires and stuff. It really makes a big difference, especially tires, you know. You get your weight right up there, and it makes a big difference. Do you believe here at one time, right here at the fairgrounds back in the middle 50s, they used to pull right up front, right along 309 here? cement blocks and then sometimes they'd have to stand on there and, and a lot of them people that come over here especially around eight ohio they put v8s in these tractors like this in fact the guy showed me a picture one here a while back and it had a mercury motor on it you know mercury i thought it was a ford and he said no i had a mercury motor and he showed the picture of it you know his dad and him pulling back in the 50s you know. i'm larry boniface with propel automation of ohio thanks jim thank you very much really nice talking to you <laughs>